Hello, it's the Friday Talkie, and um, what the hell have I got to talk about today? Only one topic, actually. Um, it's something that kind of crossed my mind this week whilst playing Engage games on this Engage, as you do. And I guess the title is What If? The thing with the Engage, it is very flawed. It's also, it could have been really good. Um, the games on it are, well, they're patchy. Some of the, they, they look like they could have been good and possibly could be better if the handheld itself had been designed slightly differently. And this is going to be entirely an opinion piece. I mean, it's all very, very subjective. I think this is not a bad handheld or very nearly not bad. Um, the things I think they could have done to make it a lot better. Well, the first thing is rip the phone out of it. It, if this had been a purely a handheld gaming device and not a phone, you wouldn't have had all the bad mm, press, shall we say? Where I mean that, no, uh, ridiculous. I've probably got it upside down as well doing it. I don't know which way. I've never used it as a phone ever. Um, so just that aspect of it kind of made it silly. The D-pad's alright, the positioning is alright, but this lot, no. I mean, they're there because it's a phone, but when you're playing a game, you don't want to have to sit there and go, which button am I meant to be pressing? Which is what I do quite often when I'm trying to play it. And the other problem is that screen. It's bright enough, it's clear enough, it's bloody tiny. It is too small. I mean, that's... It's like a Game Boy Micro screen sideways. And my eyesight being what it is, I struggle. I either have to hold it out like that to see it whilst looking through my glasses, or look over my glasses and do that. And that either way looks stupid and is inconvenient because it it's not a natural way to play a game. Fair enough if you're, you're younger than me and haven't got like bad eyesight and stuff like that. But for someone like me, it's just, it's not working. Needed a bigger screen, get rid of half the buttons, get rid of the telephone side. I mean, yeah, they, they kind of broke new ground in having a telephone as a fairly competent gaming device. And smartphones now are pushing handheld consoles completely out of the market, or almost, um, certainly giving them a hard time. I personally don't like them. Anything that's using a touchscreen for controls, don't like it. To me, there will always be room for a handheld. Though, for me, I have the perfect handheld. It would take something really incredibly special to knock the Game Boy Advance SP 101 off of the top spot, because to me, that's perfect. I, I couldn't ask for... No, I could ask for a little bit more processing power to do better 3D, but you know, it's about there. So this, eh, it's one. Of, it's a nearly device. Anyway, that's. I was thinking about that this week, while I was playing it, thinking this could so almost have been brilliant, and it got me thinking about other consoles and handhelds and things, and thinking what if stuff basically that failed and pondering what could they have done to stop that from failing. There's one that comes to mind right behind me. <laughs> C64GS. What could they have possibly done with that so that it wouldn't fail? Well, how about include a keyboard? Wait, didn't they do that? Yes, and it was mega successful. That was an idiotic thing. I don't think they could have made it work as a console ever. It was stupid. But there, there were lots of things that could have. The Atari Jaguar. I like the Jaguar a lot. It, it, on a technical level it was flawed. The hardware wasn't quite finished. The biggest problem with the Jaguar was Atari. They were broke. They needed the money fast so they pushed it out before it was really properly finished. Software was kicked out the door that never should have been sold in the form it was. I mean it was just shoddy. I'm not sure how Atari got into that position entirely. I mean, pushing the wrong 
into the wrong market. I mean, the ST was just, I don't know, did they lose money on that? They weren't doing too well on the 8-bit computers at the time. And they were certainly getting things a bit wrong, like the XEGS console. That didn't do well. It seemed like they had a whole string of failures on stuff that would have been and could have been good, but it was always too little too late. And it was the same story with the Jaguar, really. If they could have... They might even have survived, or it might have done better, had they had... Like the first Christmas that it was available, it was released just before Christmas, and customers were crying out for it, and certainly Atari UK had people, you know, on the phone, gimme, 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 and they couldn't. They hadn't got any, and they hadn't managed to produce enough. And after that, it was like they missed the Christmas rush, and by the next Christmas, everyone had forgotten about it. The PS1 was... I assume there and if it wasn't it was just about to be they blew it by being too late but they rushed it anyway it's a shame too little too late they didn't have the money I think it was everything that came before it that wrecked it they could have had more development time and more money to put into developing good software for it because let's be honest most of the software for it is appalling I like it because it's appalling and that's the thing with me, I do, I favour the underdog in just about everything. And particularly in games consoles. Uh, if there's something that failed because it's a bit crap, I probably like it. <coughs> there are some things that are actually really good but still failed that I like. Another one being the 3DO. The 3DO was great. Um, there's not a lot of really good software for it you've got Road Rash and you've got Need for Speed and to me it's like I don't care about anything else that's on it. Those two games, awesome. And why did it fail? Not actually 3DO's fault, it was the manufacturers because the 3DO company just licensed the design to the manufacturers and they set the price and that was the problem, was the price. Maybe 3DO as a company could have said you know set some kind of pricing restriction, perhaps, something in the deal that said you can't sell it for $700, that's stupid. Uh, it, it was the price, that's what wrecked it. I don't know what it cost to build, but $700 as a launch price was insane, and by the time it came down to a sensible price, it was too late, it, it, you know, no one was going to make any software for it by that time and well yeah it, it flopped damn shame because it's great and I mean that was a really really simple fix I mean something like the N-Gage it, it's uh, the design right right from the word go the design to my mind wasn't right but with the 3DO it was just something really really simple don't be stupid with your pricing don't be greedy and they were and it failed another thing that I a big what if the Mega Drive with the Mega CD and the 32X Sega were kinda I understand what they were doing in that with the Mega CD they were trying to compete with Nintendo because the Mode 7 and the fancy graphics and stuff on that were technically beating the Mega Drive in certain types of game and they needed something to bring it up to that kind of standard and then they wanted a CD-ROM drive as well and so they did it as an add-on and I, I it's a double-edged sword because as an add-on it's cheaper than releasing it as a complete you a, a whole new console but in the other sort of the other side of it you're restricting your market because the only people who are going to buy it are the people who've already got a mega drive and then there's the 32x similar problem restricted market and then they dumped them all but ignoring that for a moment I would have loved to have seen them produce a console that was like the next step up from the Mega Drive but before the Saturn in fact the Saturn never should have happened to my mind they they could have produced a console that used the CD-ROM drive the sprite scaling and rotating technology of the Mega CD and the 3D 
the CPUs or whatever in the 32X. All that into one console. Could it have been affordable? I don't know. It certainly would have been cheaper than buying all three of those separately and sticking them together and needing three massive, stupid, great big power supplies that you couldn't sit right next to each other on a, on a four-way thing. Yeah, that was stupid. But that would have been an interesting console. It would have been brilliant at 2D. It would have been brilliant as a step up from the Mega Drive and kick the ass out of the snares. And could have... It, it, in terms of development... I don't know how much would the de how much did they spend on that development they developed them already so they just should have used the technology and put it all into one console instead of just throwing it all away and starting from scratch then forget the Saturn and look at something that's made specifically for 3D like they did with the Dreamcast but by then it was too late because the the industry was just sick of them abandoning their hardware they should have kept their hardware, and they could have. And I, I think something Mega Drive, Mega CD, 32X, all in one console would have been great. It would have been a stopgap, but since they'd already developed the hardware, make use of it in a sensible way. Big, big what if? Probably not practical, but I like to think it would have been a great console because I like sprite scaling, and it would have it, it would have been incredible at that, and would have done what the Saturn does in terms of 2D. I think. The Saturn was built to be a 2D powerhouse. Well, this thing would have been. And it probably would have been a whole lot cheaper. Um, what else? Yeah. Okay. The one that makes me really sad, actually. That. The Gizmondo. That is such a big what if. Because as a piece of hardware... And even the price point, this is fantastic. It is, in most ways, not all, but most, this is better than the PSP. This is better than the DS. Uh, of the consoles, the handhelds that, that came out at that time, it's a bit grubby, this is the best. It doesn't have the most powerful graphics hardware. The PSP has more powerful graphics, but not by a massive amount. And not enough to matter. If you want gaming on the go, I actually prefer the games that you can play on this. And this is a sensible size. These buttons at the top are a bit naff, but they don't matter too much. These, the D-pad, I can get on with that. Them, I, the design is fine, I think. And it's got a camera on it as well, which is cool. And it's got GPS on it, which is cool. And it can browse the interwebs, which was cool. Um, and take... Could it take video footage? I can't even remember. Possibly. Pretty much everything you could do on the PSP, and a whole load more, you could do with this. And I think it's fantastic. And it used SD cards. Which was great. So what was wrong with this? Because, to my mind, this was bloody awesome. Uh, it was the company, the, the company who sold it. If it hadn't been run by a bunch of crooks, they took the money that was invested in this, uh, bought expensive cars and legged it. They, they had no business sense. They ha it got sold, eventually they started selling them in... Um, what are they, Maplins, you could pick them up as a sat-nav. Um, but largely, you know, Gizmondo, they had their one big, swanky, really expensive shop in London that no one went to, I seem to recall. It was always empty. Lots of staff, more staff than customers. Um, yeah, business sense, they, they just, they took the money and ran, and absolutely, the all the hard work and effort that had been put into making a really well-designed handheld, they just threw it out the window, shat all over the people who'd done all the hard work, took the money and ran. Bastards. Because this, fantastic. It's a, it's not even a big what if. It's not even a... The failure was not... There was nothing wrong with the design. I mean, some of these things, it's a failure of design. Some of the... All right, the 3DO was a simple thing. They just overpriced it. This, if they had just had some business sense and hadn't been a bunch of crooks... It could have succeeded. I think it was the best handheld at the time. It's still a fantastic handheld. 
if the GBA SP wasn't so damn good, this would be my favourite handheld. It's just a little bit too big with not enough software, and I have got it hacked now. I, I can run like emulators and stuff on it, but meh. Yeah, there we are. I mean, there are. I'm, I'm just looking around the room at all the other stuff that's in here and thinking, what if? Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is an obvious what if. What if? <laughs> the Gamecom. Okay, they, they needed to do two things with this, and that's all. They needed to make it a little bit smaller, and they needed to make the screen not shite. <laughs> really. It's got lots of really, really good design features. Two cartridge slots was cool. Have I got batteries in this? No. Good. I don't like to leave batteries in, in my handhelds or anything else that has batteries in. It's not good for them. Yeah, I mean, the, the screen is the biggest letdown. It could have even got away with the size. I mean, it is too big. But it's not, it's not ridiculous. It's not like an Atari Lynx, though it's... Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can kind of get past the size of it. it. It is too chunky, but it's tolerable. But it is the screen. The touch screen was a bit insensitive, but the big problem is lag. Um, the refresh rate is appalling to the point that I mean it's just super blurro vision uh, as soon as anything moved on the screen it smears so badly it just is just a big blur fest and you can't play the game literally it's not it's not that it detracts from the enjoyment it just makes it impossible to play a lot of the games I mean Defender it's ultra fast as a game with lots of little bullets flying around and when you've got a screen that blurs when there's anything, never mind rapid movement, any movement at all, and everything just smears into a grey mess, you can't play the game. This, if it had been done properly, properly, what am I speaking in such a high tone for? If it had been done properly, could have been quite good. The PDA facility is, you know, it, was, it wasn't fantastic, but it was interesting that it was there at all. And having that touch screen it was uh, and internet access all right it was incredibly limited but it was a step in a direction that actually really worked well for Nintendo I mean you think about what they did with the DS this was like the DS a long 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 time before the DS and if they'd have done it properly they could have cornered a sector of the market but instead they 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 just went for a cheap shit screen that rendered it useless and it's a shame. It could have been good. I'm just looking around the room and thinking there are a lot of other what-ifs. But uh, I think those are, are the ones that really come to mind. Uh, there's a Philips CDI there and I'm thinking what could they have done to make that good? <laughs> yeah. I can't think of anything they could have done to make that good. There is the Philips G7000 video pack. I'll tell you what, that, that actually, it's a shame. All they needed to do with that was invest a bit of money into software development. They didn't want to make it. They, they were going to pull the plug, but like they had what, this one programmer who was like, no, come on, let me make some games for it. And they let him. And it was one guy, no matter the development team, just one guy, no investment whatsoever, you know, I guess they just paid him a, a flat wage or whatever. And he churned out the games and, and they were good. But if there had been a whole team there and some investment and development, it could have kicked ass. But they had no faith in their own product and that's a shame. I don't know if that was Philips or Magnavox who were taking that kind of stance, but either way. Shame, they should have just had a bit of faith, because technically it was a more advanced system than the Atari 2600, which promptly kicked its ass, but there you go. Yeah, so I'm waiting for the Tesco lorry to arrive. Um, managing to do this at all right now is, is quite a feat. I've just had a driving lesson just um, just before I start started recording. I've just got back, uh, been trundling around town. It was weird, actually. It, 
the plan had been to do big roundabouts. I've done mini roundabouts, and he said, right, we'll do big roundabouts. But then it was like mid-afternoon, and it was busy, and he decided, I'll tell you what, we'll take advantage of this and get you used to busy centre-of-town type roads with roundabouts and traffic lights and junctions, and God, you had me going round and round, down, down one-way streets and trying to catch me out on stuff and putting me in difficult situations, difficult traffic, and uh, it was stressful. I got in a sweat, but I didn't make any diff uh, any bad decisions. I, there was that one old boy in one of those little invalid buggies that I probably could have ran over, <laughs> but uh, I didn't. Yeah, it was good. I'm I'm making progress. Got the the theory and has a perception test on the thirtieth. The thirtieth of this month, and I'm quite confident about that. I don't know how long. I mean, it's going to be a while before I get anywhere near the practical test. But it's going well. Um, anyway, I've got a shout out. So let me turn the camera around. Here we are. Then it's the shadow's nose who is from Germany. And what can I tell you about him? He does this series of videos called Let's Compare. Now, there, there are a few good com comparison channels. Um, I, I will have more to say about one of those in the near future. <laughs> but this one, this is the one I've been watching just lately. Just lots of really cool retro games comparing, well, CPC and Commodore 64 last night, the one I was watching last night, it was 1942. What have we got here? Are they all CPC? No, I know there's some Atari ones. Yeah, here we go. C64, CPC, Atari ST, Amiga on Pac-Mania. I haven't actually watched that one yet. I need to because that will be interesting and well worth looking at, I think. Yeah, Commando. I like Commando. Commodore 64, CPC, ST, Amiga. Lots and lots of Let's Compares, various different systems. I know there's one, there's a Super Zax on, on the Commodore 64 and Atari 8-bit. What's this? Inside another 1570. Was, is that a disk drive? I'm guessing it is. The Atari disk drive. Mm. So it's not all Let's Compare. You get other stuff as well. But predominantly, it is Let's Compares. And I like those. They're good. He, uh, they have commentary with them. There are, I mean, there are a few channels out there that compare different versions of a game. But all you, you get the game, you get the game play. But I like them with commentary in particular. And this, he does good commentary. Yes, straight, matter of fact, to the point. Says what he likes about it, what he doesn't like about it, and compares them. And that's what it's all about. Obviously, being from Germany, he's got the accent, but it's not, um, you know, his English is perfectly good and you can understand every word he says. So, uh, that's co I'm sitting here because I've only watched a few. I don't know exactly what is on here. Um, generally, I decide if I'm going to shout out a channel based on, like, the general idea and I watch a few videos and think, yep, yeah, that's good, but I haven't necessarily watched everything and I haven't watched everything here. So as I sit here and look, I'm seeing what he's got. Quick tour of his gaming corner. Weird stuff. Overly complicated joysticks. You know what? I'm looking at that one there. I had one of those. I wonder if I've still got it. I need to rummage in my loft and see if I still have that because it was strange and big. Yeah. Long plays. He's got some long plays. Tour de France. Commodore 64. Floppy emulator. On Amiga 500. Interesting. I'm going to have to have a look at that. I've seen some of these here floppy emulator things on um, eBay. I should have a look and see what that's all about. There you go. It is a cool and interesting and informative channel. Definitely very informative. I like it. I recommend checking him out. That is... The Shadow's Nose. He's at 76, 76 subscribers at the moment. I always like to say how many they've got because I like to look back later, like a couple of weeks, and see if they've got many more. Because it's, it's interesting to see if these shout outs actually do any good or not. And they seem to sometimes, but not always. And it's. I like to gauge how well, what, what are people wanting to watch. Which actually wouldn't affect what I choose to shout out, because I just shout out the stuff I like. But anyway, I like this. The Shadow's Nose. 
Right, let me turn the camera around. So, what have I got coming up? Ain't got a clue, is the short answer. Don't know. Uh, uh, duh. I'm going to have some more Engage. I am going to have a... I don't know, maybe some more GBA stuff. I got another GBA game today. Um, it's Donkey Kong, but it's, it's NES Donkey Kong. And it's like, do I really need to show you that? I've done a video of Donkey Kong for the NES already, and it's just the same game. So I'm like, nah, I don't know, maybe. I'm trying to think, I've got another G... Have I got another GBA? No, I haven't got any more GBA games coming at the moment. I've got a PS1 game coming, and I've got an Engage game coming, and that's about all at the minute. Um, what else have I got? What have I got planned? I want to do some more Oryx stuff. I do want to do some Commodore 64 stuff, because I've got a SD card chock full of games that will go on. I've got a, a virtual floppy drive thingy, and I want to do some more of that. And I want to do some more BBC Micro stuff as well. And a whole uh, stuff. I tell you what's coming up. Games, and lots of them. <laughs> I might do some more joystick of the day. I need to. I need to do some more system overviews as well. They're harder to do, and it is getting, it's tricky fitting them in. Having the driving lessons kind of makes it hard, actually, to, um, well, doing this Friday talk is hard, trying to cram it in at the end of the day. There you are. There's lots of stuff coming. I don't know exactly what it's going to be. I'm making it up as I go along. I always do, I just do this what's coming next thing because it's a habit, it's it's a routine and, and people expect it, but you know, it's waffle, it doesn't mean anything. What I say I'm going to do is probably not what I'm going to do at all. Mm. Still waiting for a Tesco order to arrive. It's meant to be here about now. He's not here yet. I wonder how long I could sit here saying nothing and there'll still be people watching. <laughs> I'll shut up now. Thank you for watching.